I'm Stephen Carroll. This is your Essential Business Briefing. Coming up, trade deals 20 years in the making. What have the EU's latest agreements taught us about how the bloc negotiates? Is rent control the solution to the spiralling cost of living in big cities? And how do you market a book when you can't say who wrote it or what it's about? We'll take you behind the scenes of how tell-all titles are published. First up, though, the European Union has concluded two major trade deals in recent days, one with Vietnam and the other with the Mercosur bloc of Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay and Uruguay. Both still need to be ratified by the Member States and the European Parliament, but they've been agreed at a time when trade tensions among other major economies are rising. Officials say that negotiating the accords was a long and difficult process. This is a historical moment. These negotiations have been two decades in the making. And the fact is that today, exactly today, 20 years ago, they were launched the 28th of June, 1999, in Rio de Janeiro. So they've been long. Well, let's talk about this further with André Sapir. He's a senior fellow at the think tank Bruegel, but also worked as an advisor in the European Commission for more than a decade. André, thanks for being with us today. Now, this deal was actually under negotiation when you worked Pleasure. in the European Commission. Should we be surprised that it took this long to conclude it? Well, frankly, I thought it would never be uh, concluded. Uh, it was not a surprise to me that it was difficult. And one reason I think why it was difficult is that Mercosur... Uh, is not at all an integrated uh, set of countries like the European Union. Uh, it has a very small secretariat, nothing like uh, the European Commission, you know, to coordinate countries. Uh, and there is one country, Brazil, uh, which is much, much bigger than all the others, even though there is also Argentina then, then there are two, uh, two other countries. But it's a very, very different makeout of, of countries than the European Union is. Plus, obviously, there were the trade issues, the agriculture and you know, the usual thing. But really, the politics uh, of this and how to organise each other, I think, is the reason why it took, uh, it took so long. Now, we've seen this deal being hailed as a success by all sides, but we have had protests, notably by farmers here in France, against what happened. Do they have things to worry about with this deal, do you think? Look, I mean, what is, uh, what is the nature uh, of a deal like, uh, like this one? And I personally support uh, this deal. Uh, a deal like this entails liberalisation. And uh, we are removing some of our trade barriers vis-à-vis -vis their products. And they are removing their trade barriers vis-à-vis -vis our uh, exports. And uh, necessarily, when you remove some barriers, well, some firms... Uh, are being less protected, and yes, it does involve some displacement. So overall, it brings, I think, a lot of economic gains, but uh, in some specific areas, uh, there will be some, uh, some displacement. Uh, but a deal like this is not just about liberalisation, it's also, and maybe even more so uh, mainly, uh, about uh, rules uh, of the game. And I think that's very, very important. Uh, there's a lot of issues about regulation, all the regulatory uh, aspects of international trade are being dealt with in this arrangement. And that's why the deal itself uh, is going to be rather voluminous. Uh, you know, there'll be a lot of issues that are being uh, dealt with. It's not just about agriculture and about cars uh, that have received mo most of the attention, but it's also about many, many other, uh, other, other matters. More generally, the EU has a reputation of being very tough in trade negotiations. Is that justified? Well, I mean, the EU is uh, tough or is viewed as tough, I think, for two, uh, for two reasons, which I think are justified and are well known. One is the EU is big and uh, most of the partners with whom we have been dealing with, uh, with the exception of the US, and, you know, uh, we see that this is going to be a very, very tough nut to crack. But usually those partners are much smaller than we are. And that was the case for, for Mercosur as well. So, in a sense, there was, uh, you know, uh, a, big, uh, a big set of countries, the EU, and a smaller grouping of countries. In a sense, from the smaller uh, partner, there's always the, the, the view that the bigger one is, uh, is, being, uh, is being very, very tough. I think that's one element. Uh, the other is that the EU, uh, although we have a, you know, single trade, uh, trade policy, 
and uh, the Commission negotiates on behalf of the member states, the member states are present, in a sense, uh, along the way in the, in the negotiation. Uh, the Commission has to regularly uh, meet with the, with the member states, with the Council, and you know, keep them abreast of what is the where is the negotiation going. And now there's also the European Parliament, which is a very, very important actor. Uh, plus, indeed, in this case, there may be even national parliaments. So from the Commission that negotiates, their room for manoeuvre uh, is really very, very complicated by the fact that not only they negotiate with the partner uh, here, Mercosur, but they've also to negotiate within the European Union with all the actors, uh, the Council, the, the European Parliament, the national parliaments, and uh, obviously more and more uh, civil, uh, civil society. And, and for, that makes also the Commission appear as a difficult actor. I mean, for that reason, I was going to ask you if the new Commission may change the approach to negotiating trade deals, but you don't seem to think that it will? No, I don't think so. I, I would say that uh, Cecilia Malmström did change compared to earlier uh, Commissioners of Trade. Uh, and I suppose that was partly because she, uh, she's from uh, Sweden, uh, which is probably a more transparent uh, society in terms of politics than many of the, uh, of the member states. And uh, she really uh, opened uh, the, the discussion. Uh, she made it much more transparent than it was the case before. One has to remember that in earlier days, the negotiating mandate uh, of the Commission uh, was not published. Not because of the Commission, by the way, because of the member states that did not want that, but Mrs. Malmström insisted uh, with the member states that the mandate needs to be, needs to be uh, made uh, available to everyone. And also along the way in the negotiation, uh, she really kept uh, everyone informed of where, of where they were going. So she certainly brought a lot of transparency. I don't believe that uh, the Commission or the member states will be able to, uh, to go back uh, to earlier situations. So, you know, yes, we are in a new world of more transparency, and I think that's good, but it makes also the negotiation more, more complicated. OK, Andres Peer from Bruegel in Brussels, thank you very much for speaking to us. Thank you. Well, it's been a major battle for the mayor of Paris, but rent controls have finally been reintroduced in the French capital as of July 1st. Rents on new leases are now capped in reference to an index price for each neighbourhood determined by the government. The idea has been tried before in Paris for two years, before it was struck down by the courts. How to keep city living affordable for renters is a debate that's being had all over the world, but do rent controls help to solve a housing shortage? Kate Moody's been looking into this, Kate. Well, Stephen, cities across the globe have mainly tested two different kinds of regulations. Rent control, which Paris has now ushered in, sets a ceiling on how much can be charged. Rent stabilization is a limit on how much that number can be raised. Both can either be applied over the period during which a tenant remains in the property or when a new lease is signed. Now, Berlin recently brought in one of the more radical programs, which will see all rents frozen for five years. Amsterdam regulates rent with a point system for size, location and amenities, but it remains one of the most expensive cities in Europe. Vienna doesn't have formal caps, but more than two-thirds of residents rent municipal or publicly subsidized housing, making it one of the most affordable cities in the world. Regulations do help keep prices in check. In Paris, for example, the average rent soared 50 percent between 2005 and 15. During the short period that controls were brought in from 2015 to 2017, the rise was only 1 percent. Proponents of rent control argue that it protects low- and middle-class families from being squeezed out of city centres. But economists widely say the measures are counterproductive. Having more restrictions can actually discourage owners from putting their property on the rental market, leading to fewer options. There's less turnover because renters stay put longer. Landlords also invest less money in upkeep and improvements, so the quality of housing tends to drop. One Nobel laureate summed up rent control as the worst example of poor planning by governments lacking courage and vision. Stephen? Ouch. That's harsh words. Thanks, Kate. Now, have you ever wondered how tell-all books get published without spoilers? Well, potentially explosive titles are printed under top-secret conditions, 
Sometimes the booksellers aren't even told who wrote the book until it arrives. The secrecy is actually a key marketing tool, as Aaron Ogunke now reports. Former President Nicolas Sarkozy's book is on shelves and ready to be sold. But just weeks ago, the manager of this bookstore didn't even know she'd have it in stock. One month before its release, I was told by email that a book would be published, that a significant number of copies would be printed, and that it would receive a lot of press attention. I wasn't informed of the author or the title, just that it would be the most important release this summer. Nicolas Sarkozy's book was printed in an extremely secretive publishing process. The same procedure was used for the release of former First Lady Bernadette Chirac's book several years ago. Everyone involved is subjected to strict confidentiality rules, starting with the printing company. This one in particular is accustomed to handling sensitive material. No one from outside this company is allowed to access these machines. We keep all the scraps. And of course, people are strictly forbidden from leaving the premises with copies in their bags. And of course, from taking any photos or videos. Any unused pages are conserved in this bin and only thrown out once the book is published. But sometimes even that is not enough. In 2014, the book by Valérie Trielweiler, former French president François Hollande's former partner, was printed in Germany to avoid leaks. And publishers often use another marketing tool, announcing a book's publication at the last minute to generate excitement, though it can be a risky move. It's important not to disappoint when you publish this way. The book really has to meet people's expectations, respond to their curiosity. If you do this with a book by someone who doesn't arouse much interest, even if it's a good book, it doesn't bode well. Perhaps the most profitable strategy, a worldwide release date to maximize sales. It's the method Michelle Obama opted for, which worked just as planned. More than 10 million copies of her book have already been sold. Well, that's it from us for now, but you can always find the best of our business coverage on our Facebook page, France 24 Business, or you can tweet me with your questions and comments at New Stephen. Until next time, thanks for watching. L'existence de l'Ebola, moi, je ne crois pas. On nous force de croire que la maladie existe. Rumours and violence. An Ebola epidemic strikes North Kivu province in the east of the Democratic Republic of Congo. 1,400 are dead. But the international relief teams are not welcome. Lack of security, political discontent, and failures of communication by medical organizations are causing popular distrust. Our observers have been there to see for themselves. Don't miss their account on The Observers, on France 24 and France24.com.